I want to start this video by saying that I have a deep love for Scotland and its people. I was taught in high school that the English saw them as savage barbarians. But as I grew and learned more about history, I came to admire their resilience, courageousness, patriotism, and their all-round down-to-earth character. Then many years later came the blockbuster film Braveheart. Whilst it suffered from some at times tragically wrong historical inaccuracies, the heart of the film was beyond faithful to its portrayal of the character of William Wallace and the Scottish people in general. So much so that the film remains a guilty pleasure for many patriotic Scots to this day. It had an unprecedented effect on Scottish tourism, igniting a renewed worldwide interest in Scottish history, and so many people took up the hobby of historical medieval reenactment and I was one of them. Braveheart's release in 1995 coincided with a growing Scottish independence movement that began in the 19th century, inspiring in Scotland a newfound sense of identity, leading to a striving for independence, with a devolved Scottish Parliament eventually convening for the first time since 1707. It is no coincidence that the undisputed symbol of Scotland's sovereignty, the Stone of Destiny stolen by King Edward I in 1226, was returned to Edinburgh a year after the film's release, which was also the date of the fast of the 17th of Tammuz, which is interesting. This oblong piece of sandstone, measuring 66 centimetres by 42 centimetres and weighing approximately 152 kilograms, used in the inauguration of all the Scottish kings until 1296, was and still is a very prized possession of the Scots. Now, anyone familiar with the content of this channel and knows about the Stone of Destiny might be thinking, Jason, if you are going to say that this was the very stone that Jacob rested his head on, it has been proven by geologists who confirmed that the stone was a lower old red sandstone that was quarried in the vicinity of Scone in Scotland. To this, I want to say a few things that you may not have thought about. Number one, there are a few excellent fakes floating around and at least one other stone referred to by the same name in Ireland. Therefore, it cannot be determined beyond any reasonable doubt that the one examiner was the right one, unless all of them were subject to the same examination, which they have not been. Number two, on its own, the material value of the stone is worthless. Something that is worthless only attributes value due to its past ownership, rarity, or its involvement with a significant or series of significant events. After all, it's not a piece of jewelry or a block of gold, it's a stone, just a plain old chunk of sandstone. Added to this, all official websites confess that its earliest origins are unknown. So one's opinion on it shouldn't completely rule out someone else's. Number three, over the centuries, the stone has accrued many names. The Stone of Destiny, the Stone of Scone, the Coronation Stone, and perhaps the most curious and controversial, Jacob's Pillow Stone. This suggests a hand-me-down scenario, as the stone undergoes a change of name when it undergoes a change of ownership. Clearly, its value has never been attributed to its worth as an object or even its rarity. It's a stone. Look down beneath your feet, you are standing over them wherever you walk. Its value is attributed to its origin and later through its traditional use in validating the legitimacy of Irish, Scottish and English royalty. It's also interesting to note that all the three nations who historically didn't always get along all seem to agree on this stone's significance. The stone's previous ownership should not draw any negative light to be attributed to the nation of Scotland if this stone was indeed of biblical origin, especially when its acquisition was not through theft, but passed down initially by Jeremiah the prophet, as the legend goes. Wouldn't this be rather something to be proud of? Unless someone has an issue with the Bible in general, or even the Jews, anti-Semitism perhaps? The stone actually began as many stones, well at least at first, but I'll explain this shortly. You see, when Yaakov, that is Jacob, was traveling from Beit Lechem to Haran, he stopped at a certain place to lay down for the night. And Genesis 28.11 continues, When Yaakov reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. He took of the stones of that place and he put them under his head and lay down to sleep. That night he saw a vision of Malachim, angels, ascending and descending via a great portal. Then Hashem himself appeared to him, affirming his promises through his grandfather Avraham and his father Yitzhak. Yaakov realized that he had laid down to sleep at the very gateway to the heavens, and he made a vow upon the rocks that had now become one rock and anointed it as a pillar to be set amidst a house dedicated to Elohim. The Hebrew text uses the term mi avne, which is the plural for stone, but later in Genesis 28:18, Yaakov refers to the same stone in the singular as a ha-aven, which means the stone. 
Rashi writes, he arranged them in the form of a drain pipe around his head because he feared the wild beasts. They, the stones, started quarreling with one another. One said, let the righteous man lay his head on me. And another said, let him lay his head on me. Immediately the Holy One, blessed be he, made them into one stone. This is why it is stated in verse 18, and he took the stone in the singular that he had placed at his head. This is from Talmud tractate Kulin 91b. The stone went on to be present at the coronation of all the kings of Israel, then all the kings of Ireland, and all the kings of Scotland, and then all the kings of England, including Queen Elizabeth II. After Yaakov's death, the Bethel stone remained the possession of his sons. It is likely that the tribe of Yehuda became its guardian, since the stone had come to be linked to royalty. Given the importance of the stone, there is no doubt that it accompanied the children of Israel on their journey from Mitzrayim, that is Egypt, to the promised land. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 to 4 does mention that a rock accompanied the children of Israel that produced water for them. The stone of Jacob is mentioned throughout the Tanakh almost exclusively as a pillar of witness in the coronation of the kings of Israel, including the foreign king Avimelech. It was traditional to crown kings of Israel on this stone, as we read in 2 Kings 11:14, as the manner was. But how did this stone end up so far away in a foreign land? The prophet Jeremiah is recorded in 2 Maccabees chapter 2 verse 4 and 8 as taking the Ark of the Covenant and its chief furnishings to Mount Nebo and hid them in a cave. According to established Irish history, Jeremiah visited Ireland several years after the fall of Jerusalem in Babylon. He and several members of the Davidic family, notably Tamar or Tia Tefi, as she is commonly referred to, the daughter of Zedekiah, the 20th and last king of Yehuda, and Baruch, the prophet's personal assistant and scribe, when they escaped to Mitzrayim and then went on to Ireland. Jeremiah also bought several significant items to the Isles, including a stone that the Irish subsequently named La Fell, meaning Stone of Destiny, which incidentally refers to another stone that stands in Ireland today. It is noteworthy to mention that the Royal Banner of Scotland depicts a red lion symbolizing the line of Judah. Tamar also came with her sister Scota, arriving in Hibernia in 583 BCE. Hibernia is the Latin name for Ireland. Princess Tamar married Ikad Beduk, the 60th King of Ireland, thus planning the House of David in Hibernia. Strong Cyclopedia, Volume 2, page 600 to 601, says something very interesting about the early inhabitants of Hibernia, before the arrival of the Catholic missionary Augustine in 596 CE. Noting that these people were not yet Romanized, they were still following the ancient traditions of Israel, and thus are described the Scottish when it first meets the eye of civilization, is not Romanish, nor even prelatical. These Christians are the Chaldees, whose chief seat was the little island of He, or Iona, on the western coast of Scotland. The Chaldees, for the most part, had a simple and primitive form of Christianity. While Romans presented a vast accumulation of superstitions and was arrayed in her well-known pomp, after the success of Augustine and the monks in England, the Chaldees had shut themselves up within the limits of Scotland and had resisted for centuries all the efforts of Rome to win them over." End of quote. Eventually, Tamar's sister, Princess Scota, left Ireland marrying Godel Glass, founder of the Scots, whose name was given to the neighbouring island, Scotland. Subsequently, the royal line of David flows through the blood of many Irish and Scottish kings and later English kings the as well. The book When Scotland Was Jewish by Elizabeth Cardwell Hirschman and Donald N. Yates gives a plethora of exhausting information on the Jewish ancestry of Scotland, bringing DNA evidence, archaeology, analyses of migrations, public and family records, showing almost irrefutable Semitic roots of Scotland. However, they argued that their arrival only goes back to the 12th century. But this book is worth getting a hold of. I might also add that all this information, including the content of this video, is absolutely refuted by mainstream Scottish and Irish historians. What I am talking about here will fall into the category of legend, and legend only. But the more one studies this subject, the more information one will find that challenges this mainstream belief. The Stone of Jacob is important to discuss because its eventual return to Jerusalem will herald the coming of the Mashiach, but it will most likely be used to coronate the Mashiach Neged, the false messiah, or its absence in the coronation will be a telltale sign of his inauthenticity until the real messiah shows up. The stone was going to be used in Solomon's temple, but was rejected. The reasons are varied depending on the sources you study. The idea of a key aspect of something being rejected, but eventually being embraced, is an underlying theme throughout the Bible. We see this in the story of Yosef, and on another level, the story of Yeshua Hanotri himself. 
Many viewers are probably familiar with the famous verse from Matthew 21:42, quoting Psalms 118:22, "The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone." So when you hear the stone of Jacob being returned to Jerusalem, know that the coming of the Messiah is very near. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please hit like, subscribe, and share this video. Bye for now. Hey, before you go, if you like this series and you want to find out much more, check out our books, All Lights On in the Master's House, Lightning from the Master's House, Flying Chariot, Fallen Dragon, and Is Alcoholic. All available on Amazon.com and other online bookstores and help us to continue to spread the word. Also check out our website, netsroomantasy.com, where we have many teachings and resources on a myriad of subjects that will enlighten and enhance your walk. Bye for now.